To learn more about earning college credits with study hall courses, go to gostudyhall.com or click the link in the description. In the 1980s, Harvard professor Herbert Benson traveled to the Himalayas to observe and study the Tibetan monks who lived there. He wanted to find better ways to treat stress-related illnesses, and he believed meditation could be a powerful tool. While he was there, he observed a group of Tibetan monks who began to meditate in a cold room, using a technique known as jitammo. As they meditated, someone wrapped their shoulders in sheets that had been soaked in cold water. The monks kept meditating and stayed warm enough that soon, steam began to rise from the sheets. The sheets were dry within an hour. It turns out that through advanced meditation, some monks were able to control their body temperature and metabolism. Some could even sleep outside in the Himalayan mountains in winter without ever appearing to become cold. Benson believed these events showed some important things about the power of the mind. And while most of us probably don't have it on our bucket list to sleep in the Himalayas without blankets, it's worth paying attention to the power our minds can have when it comes to our physical bodies and overall health. Hi, I'm Deja Fitzgerald, and this is Study Hall, Injured to Psychology. Historically, formal healthcare institutions in the United States have followed a biomedical model, where physical health issues are addressed by observing the body's physical symptoms and then prescribing a treatment or medicine. For example, let's say that you suddenly have painful daily headaches. A doctor following the biomedical model might ask if your family has a history of cluster headaches or migraines to see if there's something genetic at play. They might also ask about any past physical injuries, like a concussion, that could cause headaches down the line. After that investigation, they might prescribe an over-the-counter pain reliever to help you and continue to check in on your physical symptoms. Depending on where you're from, this might sound a lot like your experience with doctors. The biomedical model isn't a bad way to treat human illness, especially short-duration infectious diseases. In fact, because of treatments like antibiotics or vaccines, life expectancies have risen in many parts of the world. The main problem with the biomedical model is that it's, well, incomplete. Many cultures around the world have always seen the body, mind, and spirit as linked and have treated physical problems with more than just medicine. As one of many examples, Ayurveda is a healing system that originated in India more than 3,000 years ago. Ayurvedic treatment addresses illness as an imbalance in the body's systems, so a treatment plan might involve dietary supplements along with reducing stress through meditation and lifestyle changes. Many cultures' healthcare has been ignored by formal institutions because of factors like racism or colonialism, but in recent years, there has been more and more research into traditional medicine, and the underlying idea of many of these practices, that physical health isn't just about physical symptoms, has more recently become a foundational principle of other kinds of medicine too. By the end of the 20th century, medical practitioners in the United States began to investigate chronic or longer-term diseases, such as cancers, stroke, or dementia. More high-quality research began to reveal how biology intersects with psychology, behavior, and other social factors to influence physical health. And through this foundation, foundational work, the field of health psychology began to emerge. As health psychology started to gain traction, so did the biopsychosocial model of healthcare. Basically, this model says that our health depends on a combination of biological, psychological, and social factors, and treatments can target any of them. And there are a few subfields of medicine that support and work according to this perspective. One of these subfields is called psychosomatic medicine, which focuses on the idea that psychological causes can produce physical symptoms like pain. The root words psyche, which refers to the mind, and soma, which refers to the body, are smushed together to show the link between the mind and the body. Going back to that headache example, a doctor practicing psychosomatic medicine would go beyond asking about your genetic history and physical injuries. They might look into psychological reasons for your headaches, like a huge amount of stress at work, or spending time in social situations that make you feel anxious. Yep, other people can cause your headaches. If your headaches are stress-induced, it doesn't make a lot of sense to just prescribe you a new pain medication. While that treatment might help in the short term, it's not dealing with the bigger issue. Instead, treatment might look like working with a mental health counselor or other professional to learn strategies for processing stressful situations or otherwise take care of your mental health. In pop culture, the word psychosomatic has been reduced to the idea that a physical symptom like pain is all in your head, so you can just think it away with a good attitude. 
And this misconception does a lot of harm, like making it harder for people to realize that they need medical care or to receive helpful treatments. And in the United States, women and people of color are often dismissed, misdiagnosed, or told their symptoms are all in their head. Studies have shown that black patients are less likely to receive pain medication than white patients. And in one study, doctors were more confident in diagnosing heart disease in men than women, and were more likely to misdiagnose middle-aged women with a mental illness. While psychosomatic symptoms can't always be easily explained with a biological source, like a bruise or a bacterial infection, they still deserve to be taken seriously. Another subfield called behavioral medicine focuses on understanding how patients' day-to-day -day choices may create exacerbation or treat health problems. Maybe you love going to loud rock concerts every weekend, which is a kind of behavior that could contribute to headaches. So a doctor practicing behavioral medicine might go beyond prescribing painkillers and suggest ways you could care for yourself at these concerts by wearing earplugs, making sure you get eight hours of sleep afterward, or remembering to hydrate and stretch because maybe you can't do the stinky leg like your 15-year-old self anymore. Changing behavior can be really hard, even when patients are motivated to change. And that's where health psychology research can help. There's a huge body of research on how we can change our minds and behaviors, which has led to new experimental interventions for illnesses. For example, headache patients might be asked to try a technique like meditation or biofeedback to reduce pain or how often their headaches occur. Biofeedback uses monitoring to help people understand what their heart rate, breathing rate, and muscle patterns are in the moment, so they can learn what it feels like to relax different parts of their body. The biopsychosocial approach to human health and these subfields of medicine guided by this model are meant to build on effective forms of physical health care, not replace them. We still have best practices for diagnosing and treating infectious diseases or healing traumatic injuries, but even leaders like the World Health Organization are finding that improved mental health can be essential to improve improved physical outcomes and to an overall feeling of well-being. And even though we've been using headaches as an example, this focus on treating the mind and the body together has been impactful on plenty of areas, including managing stress or cholesterol and quitting smoking. No matter what kind of medicine is being practiced or what illness is being treated, a big part of health psychology is adherence. Adherence is a patient's ability to stick with a treatment plan, just like an adhesive is something that sticks two things together. There are two parts to successful adherence, an emotional or mental willingness and overcoming any external barriers. For instance, you might be fully on board with the treatment plan a doctor gives you for your headaches because you trust them and you want the pain to go away. But if that treatment plan involves wearing a super special silver hat that costs $5 million, you probably can't adhere to that plan. No matter how willing you are to wear a silver hat 24 seven, even if it's inconvenient, you don't have $5 million to spend, no matter how much you wanna lick this cool. But there are lots of very practical reasons why a person may have a hard time adhering to a treatment plan. The doctor may not communicate the plan clearly, or it may be expensive and not covered by the patient's insurance provider, or it may require the patient to go to a clinic several times a week, which requires them to take time off from work and find childcare and transportation. So a huge part of health psychology is researching how to create treatment plans that actually fit into people's lives and implementing them appropriately. Even if that expensive silver hat is technically the most effective and coolest headache treatment, you might be better off with the second best option. So you can actually afford and adhere to the plan. Like a $5 over-the-counter medicine that won't help with the worst headaches, but will help you manage most of the day-to-day -day pain. Researching adherence is tricky too, because it typically involves asking the patient and their care team about how the treatment plan is going, which can lead to a wide variety of responses. Sometimes, researchers combine those surveys with other measurements, like doing biochemical testing to see how someone's body is responding. When a medical professional only sees their patient for a few minutes every once in a while, maybe only enough to outline a plan, they may not see the adherence or results they hope for. But the field of health psychology intersects with lots of other community initiatives to provide healthcare and promote adherence to treatment plans. For example, in many communities where access to healthcare is particularly low, a very effective model has been the addition of community health workers. In many cases, these workers visit patients in their own homes to prevent crises through education and checking in. Community health workers can help with adherence to a treatment plan 
or reinforcing messages from a medical professional. On a visit, a community health worker might find out that a patient has misplaced a medication, forgot to get a refill, or wasn't sure about their medication schedule. These short visits may save the patient a whole lot of suffering and the whole healthcare system a lot of money, since sticking to an effective treatment plan is way less stressful than a sudden health emergency. While community health workers are just one example of a systemic change, they're a really powerful example of the long-term positive outcomes that can come from health psychology and biopsychosocial care. Health psychology research represents an impressive boost in our understanding of ourselves as complex beings. In subfields like psychosocial Somatic medicine and behavioral medicine bring a mental health focus to the foreground of treating illnesses. Which isn't to say that we should try to heal broken legs with good vibes, or that we can get over our pain and illness if we just concentrate hard enough. And there's much more to say about all of this. We'll talk more about chronic illness and the connection between our minds and bodies in other episodes. But these fields are tackling the complex work of healthcare with a combination of biological explanations, psychological studies, and social or cultural elements. And that matters because there's more to health and humans than our physical symptoms. If you're enjoying Study Hall Intro to Psychology and are interested in taking an online course and earning college credit, go to gostudyhall.com or click on this button to learn more. Thanks for watching. See you next time.